of you read chapter 8? Okay, you got like four gold. I don't mean, you know, I, yeah, I read it once in my life and I hated it. I mean, did you read it this week? We still got four gold stars. Good. Good for you guys. I'm, I'm, uh, you remember last week, chapter 7, Solomon kind of changed course a little bit. Uh, 1 through 6, he's being the hedonist, you know. Whatever I can do for fun, whatever I can try out, whatever's new, whatever's different. And he had the means to be able to do it in a way that none of us have ever been able to do. Uh, you want to talk about physical love? You can get married, right? I married 700 women and I got 300 concubines on top of that. I, nobody's ever beat his record as far as I know. You know, you want to talk about wealth? I got so much gold and silver that silver is like dust on the ground. It's just rocks in the street. You know, I've got horses. I've got stables in chariot cities. I've got thousands of horses. Everything God told him not to do, he did, right? Multiply wives, multiply gold and silver, multiply horses. And it just wasn't good. He kept saying, vanity, vanity, vanity. This is a worthless. This is a waste of time. This is soap bubbles. This is nothing permanent, nothing lasting. And I'm bored. And I'm, uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for? I guess bored, it's what my grandkids always say, I'm bored. My gosh, you've got a billion toys. I know, I played with them all. Some, somebody once said, can you imagine a little girl having the entire Barbie Playland collection? How, yo, you had it? Yeah. Wow. And how long were you interested in that? Years. Years? You're, you're, you're different. <laughs> Most kids get the toy. I watched my grandsons on Christmas, and it's like, I got a toy, and two days later, maybe one day later, it's like, what else we got, you know? What else is there? Is that all there is? And that's where Solomon is. Is that all there is? There's got to be something more to life. So he kept on trying. You remember building projects, gardening projects, writing books, having uh, the best bands in the world come to his house for parties and entertainment and everything else, doing everything he can to try and fill that empty spot in his life. Now, he knew who the Lord was. He had a relationship with the Lord. But we see that he's moved away from that. He had that when he was young. We also see in Scripture that it was wives who had moved him away from that relationship. And he warns us about that, being very careful in the book of Proverbs and as well as Ecclesiastes. You know what? There, there are wonderful women that God uses mightily, like the uh, Proverbs 31 woman, also uh, Wisdom is personified as a woman in the book of Proverbs. But there's also the other woman that we find in the book of Proverbs who will lead you away from the things of the world, uh, from the things of the Lord to the things of the world. And he's saying we need to be very careful about that. But um, sometimes when I'm reading this, I'm thinking I'm all by myself. Nobody wants to read this book. <laughs> That's why I ask who read it, and I'm glad to see you raised your hands because it's good to know that I'm not alone. Other people are slogging through this in certain ways, right? And we're, we're going to get through the book. We're continuing our chapter by chapter, verse by verse study of the book of Ecclesiastes. And, and for a lot of people, this is just a um, depressing experience. Man, this guy is just, uh, somebody called him Debbie Downer. And he's just, he's just depressed about everything. He's frustrated with everything. Uh, he's not happy with anything that's going on. And uh, others think this is totally pessimistic. Why is this even here? Do you know the early rabbis who wanted to put uh, Bible or books in what we would call the canon? I'm not talking about the Christian council to put together the Bible we have. Now, I'm talking about Jewish councils. Uh, many of them thought, we don't need this book in here. He's not really talking about God. He's talking about life under the sun. And this is depressing and this is horrible. So uh, let's get some more exciting books in here. We've got stories with wars and we've got stories with triumphant battles and wonderful kings and horrible kings. It's like drama. It's like daytime TV or something, you know, Telemundo. <laughs> but... Uh, but he's, he, there's other people who think that Solomon really has got something here. You have to remember, he's a very intelligent man. And he's just right now going through all the things he can possibly go through and thinking about those things in life. He's admitted that life does seem meaningless in many ways, uh, or at least that the plot isn't immediately clear. And that's why he's still looking. 
He still wants to find something that's worthwhile. Now, when we started chapter 7, he moved away from that hedonist position where he was just trying to find everything good, and he's moved into a moral position. He's a, a moralist, and he's going to do things right and proper and, and acceptable in society. But he's also finding out that is not meeting the need. That's not filling the blank. It's not taking care of that emptiness inside of him. And uh, so he still continues walking around under the sun, and under the sun means without the Lord, because the Lord is above the sun, in the heavens, seated in heavenly places. He is under the sun looking for fulfillment. And you and I all know that fulfillment does not come from things of the earth. But Solomon had to prove it, and he had the means to do that too. So he wants to show us wisdom is good, but by the end of the chapter, he's also going to express that it has its limitations. I'm a wise man. I've been uh, known as the wisest man in the world, but I, I don't know everything. I can't find out everything. And we mentioned before about how when you start learning things, if you get into one field of study, the more and more you learn, the more and more you realize you don't really know because it keeps expanding. There's so much more to know. Now, the first four verses here are about wisdom and the wisdom in obeying the king, honoring the king. And it seems a little self-serving as you first look at it because he's the king, right? So I'm telling you, it's a good thing to obey the king. I'm the king, you should obey me. It's a good thing to honor the king. And since I'm the king, you should honor me. But it goes beyond that, okay? It, it sounds self-serving a little bit there, but uh, he's actually, this is going to, you're gonna see that it points to a higher king. We as believers read these books of the Old Testament looking for Jesus Christ. And this is good advice when we consider who our king is. And there's wisdom and in honoring and obeying the Lord Jesus Christ, King Jesus. He that bought us with his blood deserves to be obeyed in all things, with all our hearts, with all our mind, with all our soul, and with all our strength. So uh, true wisdom, we find out as we go through the scriptures, comes from obedience. If we will just obey the word, life is so much better than when we don't. And yet there's so many times we're tempted to think, oh, I can handle this one. I don't need to talk to God. I've, I've been through this before. Well, why did you go through it before? Why are you going through it again? Because you didn't talk it over with dad. So take that time. So he starts out and says, who is like a wise man? Who's really like a wise man? And who knows the interpretation of things? Who can understand all these things? I actually think Solomon was probably looking for someone to talk to. Super intelligent. He'd like to carry on a dialogue with somebody, but there's nobody in his caliber of being able to discuss things with. And it's kind of like, okay, I'm writing down what I'm seeing. I'm writing down what I'm feeling. I'm trying to share this with everybody, but I'm not sure everybody gets it. And a lot of people don't. A lot of people read this book and go, wow, this is horrible. <laughs> and when do we get through with this one? Well, take your time, read through it. Realize that he's a little redundant. He keeps repeating under the sun, under the sun, vanity, vanity, vanity. And that's true with the moralist as much as it was with the hedonist. And uh, so who knows these things? And then he goes on and says, man's wisdom makes his face shine. And the sternness of his face, and the sternness of his face is changed because he's found wisdom. It's exciting. It's good. His face lights up. He shines with this. And, and we know that a wise man, uh, when, when a man is wise, there's a shine in his countenance, how his face will shine. I always think, of course, immediately back to Moses. He was alone spending time with the Lord. And when he came down from the mountaintop after 40 days, he's glowing. He didn't know he was glowing, but people could see the difference. And it will happen at times when you're close to the Lord and spending a lot of time with the Lord. People may ask you, what's going on with you? Why do you act different? Why do you look different? I've seen this happen many times uh, with people who, as they draw close to the Lord, just seem to lighten up. They're, this, this is good, but it can be bad too if you're not careful. The bad instance is, I, I knew a couple of girls, this happened more than once, where they were, don't take me wrong with this, they were plain looking, okay? 
they weren't tens, they, they were probably eights, right? <laughs> All right? But even a plain person, a plain guy, a plain woman, when you've got the Spirit of God in you, it makes a difference in how you look. And what happened to both of these girls is when they accepted the Lord, when they drew close to the Lord, when they started to glow, suddenly guys took interest in them. Guys that would never talk to them. Guys that were uh, dating the tens, right? And they'd talk to this girl, they'd get to know this girl. In the one case, uh, they got married. And then he did not allow her to go to church. He did not allow her to fellowship anymore. And that glow faded. And he's kind of looking at her and going, how did I get stuck with you? And they ended up in divorce. Okay. There is a glow. There is a glow. Wisdom is attractive on an individual. Salvation is attractive on an individual. And Solomon was searching for a wise man who knew the interpretation of things. Solomon knew that wisdom makes a man happier even in an under-the-sun situation. And so the shining face generally speaks of favor. Almost every single week when we close, I quote number six to you, right? The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious upon you. I want God's face to shine upon me. I desire his favor. And I want my face to shine on other people so that I can share the good news and the grace of God with them. So he goes on and he says, I say, keep the king's commandment for the sake of your oath to God. So he was the king. Uh, many ancient societies, when you had a king and you wanted to serve there or be a part of that community, you had to pledge an oath to the king. And you would usually pledge it before God, whoever that might seem to be. In this case, God would be the God of creation, the God of heaven and earth, the God of Israel. So he said, you've, you've pledged your allegiance to the king before God. Keep your oath. I would say that's a very important statement because there's a lot of people who make oaths as believers and they forget all about it. I have them come through the office on a regular basis. We don't like each other anymore. I don't care. Who did you promise to? Well, I, I made a promise to that. You made a promise to God. Keep your oath. Keep that oath. Keep what you pledge. So uh, he was the king. You pledge your allegiance to the king. Keep the oath. And I think Solomon understood what the Apostle Paul would later write in Romans 13, that we should obey government authorities as a part of our obedience to God. Primarily, we honor government authority for the sake of our oath to God. Now, I know that's not always pleasant to the flesh. Sometimes when I'm reading Romans 13 and it says, pray for those and the government over you, it's like... Yeah, I'll pray you get them out of here. <laughs> uh, but that's not what he's talking about either, is it? Anybody ever see Fiddler on the Roof? Yeah. yeah. There's a line in there that just cracks me up. This young kid comes up to the rabbi and he says, Rabbi, is there a proper prayer for the czar? And you remember they're under persecution. They're going through the pro pogroms and everything. And, and the rabbi says, yes. Pray that God remove him. <laughs> you know? oh, no. So there's a proper prayer. And I think we should... Obey the government authority as part of our obedience to God. Primarily, we honor the government authorities because of our oath to God, okay? You, you have a sworn obedience to him, to him, so keep your oath. Do not be hasty to go from his presence. Don't run away. Do not take your stand for an evil thing, for he does whatever he pleases. Don't run away. Don't start a revolution. Don't try to overthrow the government. Uh, where the word of the king is, there is power. And who may say to him, what are you doing? So be careful how you conduct yourself in the presence of the king. By the way, with our continually upgraded communications, you may think nobody else is hearing you. <laughs> and someday somebody may grab you and say, you said this about the king. No, I didn't. Here's the recording. You didn't know we were recording you, did you? Why, we can hear you from our satellite thousands of miles away. This happened in other cultures before. Uh, the uh, Japanese used to have what was called a circle of five. Everybody met with five different people. And there was one leader in the circle of five. And when he went to his circle of five, he reported what was going on. 
in his lower circle of five. And then one leader from there would go higher and higher and higher. Finally, to the emperor's circle of five. The emperor would know within one day if somebody said something derogatory about him, and that person would be dealt with by the next day. So it's, it's an ongoing thing. Be careful how you conduct yourself. The king stands as an authority, and in that sense, he's sovereign. The sovereignty of the king also speaks to the sovereignty of God. Paul says, but indeed, O man, who are you to reply against God? Why have you made me like this? We can't do that. We can't ask that. And by the way, he does hear us immediately. He doesn't need our modern day communication system. So we have no reason to question him or ask him what he's doing. He is the king. I like to say, he's God, you're not. Let well, your words be few. So these, these first verses are saying, if you want to be wise, you must just submit to the king. Romans 13 tells us that those who are in authoritative positions over us nationally are ministers of God. And the sword is used by the Lord. So we have to say, Lord, you put these powers in place. I don't always understand it, but I know it's a part of your plan. You raise up who you want, you bring down who you want. And they will stay there as long as you want them there. And uh, I need to submit myself to them as being from you. Unless they tell me directly to do something that is contrary to your word. So we recognize that we are always to obey God rather than man. And when there's a contradiction, Acts 4.19, we say with Peter and John, is it better to serve God or better to serve man? And of course, the answer is better to serve God. I'm going to do what God tells me to do first. So Solomon is saying it's wise because ultimately, if you're patient and if you keep your word and you don't rebel against the king and you don't cause a revolution against him to overthrow him, there is coming a time, and he's going to say this again, there's coming a time when judgment comes into play. Now, verses 5 through 9, he goes through some reasons for wise living. Verse 5, he who keeps his commandment, he who keeps his command will experience nothing harmful. Uh, if you're not trying to raise a rebellion, then nobody's going to come after you. God will protect you. God will watch over you. A wise man heart discerns both time and judgment. So, Keep the commandment. It's for your benefit. It's for your blessing. Again, God has a plan. Good will come to those who obey and honor the king. Even if it doesn't come from this present society, God is watching over his own. Our king commands you because he cares about you, and his judgment is always in his timing. Lord, th this is unjust. Why aren't you taking care of it? Oh, I am, just not in your timing. So it's always for our benefit. And a wise man's heart discerns both time and judgment. A wise man will figure this out. God's in charge. And I think it's wisdom when, when people come up and go, do you see what's going on around you? You see the world's falling? Yes, I know. I've said before, we read the book. We know how it ends. Focus on the Lord. Keep your eyes looking above. Look up, look up. There will be judgment in due time. So don't freak out. And don't uh, be uptight or frantic. Things will ultimately be worked out by the Lord. We need uh, to know when and what to speak by discerning the results. If I say this, what's going to happen to me? If I do that, what's going to happen to me? That's wisdom. Think about it. Let's just focus on the Lord and do what he wants me to do. Say what he wants me to say. He goes on in verse 6. He says, because for every matter... There's a time and judgment, though the misery of man increases greatly. I'm sure some of you have read that and thought, that's right. As our government does what it does, I'm getting more and more miserable. Why? Gas prices are higher. Food prices are higher. My money's worth less. That's not exactly what he's speaking about here. It takes time for judgment. It takes time for justice to come. But wisdom knows that Solomon... Uh, First, poetically explain this to us in chapter 3. There's a time for every season under heaven, right? And a purpose for everything. Now, when you don't realize that God's in charge, or you're not focusing on the fact that God's in charge, you can grow impatient. And you will become miserable 
because we don't know what the times are. When is this going to happen? How long do I have to wait? Oh, Lord, why aren't you back here? We expected you in 1988, remember? <laughs> or sometime like that. But you didn't come. So uh, things are going on around us. And, and these things aren't to scare us. A lot of people are freaking out about what's going on around us. God didn't send those things to scare us. That's why he wrote it all down. He sent them so we could be excited. Look, it's happening. Just like he said it was going to. Governments are falling. Wars, rumors of wars. Wow, the scripture's right. I'm excited about that. I'm excited about what God is doing. For he does not know what will happen. So who can tell him when it will occur? Nobody. Only God knows the timetable. Do you remember even Jesus, when he was in human form on earth, said, only my Father in heaven knows the day or the hour. I don't have it. No one knows when things will be or how things will be. The future, from our perspective, is completely uncertain. We don't know the timing of things, so just be patient. Only God knows for sure. There's an old saying that I really appreciate. It says, I don't know what the future holds, but I know who holds the future. That should make all the difference in the world. What a blessing that is because he knows he can make plans. And that should tell me, I don't make plans, I seek him. Lord, I can have tentative plans. Lord, I've got a day timer. Lord, I've got stuff on my calendar. But Lord, is this where you want me to go today? Is this what you want me to do today? Is this your plan or is this my plan? I want to do your plan, Lord. It's always more fun. We... Uh, the first time I went to Israel, I was backpacking with a friend, and we had it all laid out. We knew where we were going to land. We knew we'd uh, written letters to hostels and had places to stay, and we're going to this place, then we're going to this place, and uh, it was all worked out. We're going to take a three-week swing around the north and a three-week swing around the south and spend time in Jerusalem, and we got there, and it was like, that's out the window. <laughs> None of it fit. None of it worked. Because it's like, today, Lord, what do you want us to do? We couldn't get out of Jerusalem for almost three weeks. There's so much to see there. But the way we saw it was going, sitting, reading the word, praying. And boy, miraculous stuff would happen. People would come up and meet us and greet us and take us home for dinner. And feed us, not take us home for dinner. They, they would feed us. Okay. Had some wonderful meals and wonderful fellowship there. But it was so freeing to know that your day was being planned by him. So we could have tentative ideas. Maybe tomorrow we'll go up to the Sea of Galilee. Maybe we won't, but it's okay because it's in his hands. Wouldn't it be wonderful if everything in our life was that way? Let it be in his hands. <laughs> who knows? He knows. He does not know what will happen. So who can tell him when it will occur? Only the Lord can. So verse 8. This is an interesting verse. No one has power over the spirit to retain the spirit. No one has power in the day of death. There is no release from that war. That's an interesting statement, isn't it? What's the war? The battle of life and death. How long can I stay along, alive? How long do I want to stay alive? How, how long can I, uh, how can I get out of here? Can I shorten that time? Can I off myself? Well, no, that's not a good plan either. You know, he's in charge here. No one has the power in the day of death. There's no release from that war. And wickedness will not deliver those who are given to it. So, no man has power over death, and when the time comes for you to die, you don't have any power over your spirit to retain it. Mm -hmm. Think about that for a minute. You're laying in the hospital bed or even laying in bed at home, and, and you know you're going to go soon, and you go, I don't want to go. I'm not through yet. I haven't finished cleaning out those boxes in the garage. Well, tough. Your kids are going to get stuck with that. <laughs> because you don't have power over your spirit to retain it. <laughs> I've heard people say, I'm not going to die. I'm going to keep. That's probably one of the problems with youth. We all think we're uh, immortal and we're going to live forever. And that's why we do dumb things, you know, extreme motorcycle riding and stuff like that. Because, hey, I'm going to live forever. True, you are, but your physical body has limitations. 
human limitation. You're going to die. Nobody wants to hear that. And the only one who exercised that kind of power over his spirit was Jesus Christ. We read when he was on the cross, he bowed his head and uh, released his spirit. Can you see that? Jesus goes, okay, you can go now. But he also had the power to pick it back up again. We actually read uh, in the book of John, it says, therefore my father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it again. No one takes it from me. I lay it down of myself. And I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it again. This command I've received from my father. Where did he get the power to lay it down and take it up? From the father. When it was time, he took up his spirit and resurrected. He has power that we don't have. Verse 9, all this I have seen and applied my heart to every work that is done under the sun. I keep checking out everything under the sun. And there is a time in which one man rules over another to his own hurt. That's interesting. You make it to the top. You end up ruling over others uh, in his condition. They may have been slaves. They may have been um, people who are... Um, you know, indentured for a while, or uh, they may be employees. You make it to the top, and it's not what you thought it would be. A lot of people at the top talk about how lonely it is up there, and it can hurt, because a lot of people will avoid you because you're the boss, I don't wanna to talk to you, I don't hang out with you, I don't, you're not my friend. Mm -hmm. You're the guy I get a paycheck from, and I'm only doing what you say because I need the paycheck. Mm -hmm. Or there's people you have to be harsh with, I have to lay this many off. I have to tell these people, you don't work here anymore. I have to be the one who goes and says, you're not doing your job right. Well, that's never fun. It hurts. <clears throat> or there may be people who say, I don't like your company and I don't like you. I'm leaving. Well, that hurts too, even if you're a tough guy. So the preacher says, I've been there. I've seen this. I know what I'm talking about. And even though I have wisdom, wisdom doesn't answer all the really big questions. I still have questions. I'm still searching it out. And I saw the wicked buried who had come and gone from the place of holiness. That's interesting. They were forgotten in the city where they had so done. This is also empty. This is also frustrating. This is also driving me crazy. I see life moving on and, and soon people are forgotten. They just all die. Doesn't matter if you're wicked or evil. Uh, or righteous, you die, and everybody forgets you. We remember the last generation, we remember our parents, we may remember our grandparents. Do you remember your great-grandparents? You remember your great-great-grandparents? Did you forget? Well, no, I, I know they were there, they had to be or I wouldn't be here, but um, I don't, most of us wouldn't know what their names are. Most of us wouldn't know where they came from that long ago. Now we've got wonderful internet services now that'll tell us. You can go and have your DNA done and they'll tell you you came from places you'd never even heard of. But uh, people who had come from a, a place of holiness, it looks like here, had moved away from there. They died and were forgotten in the city where they'd done their wickedness. Now there's another way to look at this too. Uh, they had done good, then they did bad, and then they die. And everyone forgets the wickedness and the evil. Have you seen that happen? A, a media star uh, may have done some horrible things, may have made some horrible movies, may have brought about some horrible thinking. I can think of a lot of musicians who have written songs that encourage people to do anti-biblical things. I'll put it that way, okay? And they die and everybody goes, oh, oh, he was so wonderful. Yeah, he led a lot of people into rebellion against God, caused them to sin. I know, but boy, he sure could sing, couldn't he? So they end up on the cover of magazines and they end up with giant memorials and celebrations. We don't, we don't celebrate the bad things people do, do we? I, I've been at, I'll call them funerals, where people have died and, and uh, they're walk with God is questionable, if at all. 
And there always seems to be somebody who wants you to say something good. Would you say so? a few good words? I don't have any good words. This guy was, was nasty and mean. And you don't want me to get up and say that. I, I've often thought, what do you say when you're doing a service for an unbeliever? Well, you all knew Joe. He's cooking in hell right now. <laughs> you can't say that. we got to think of something good. He loved his dog, you know. And people say stuff like, he was a good man. No, he wasn't. No, he wasn't. <laughs> but you'll hear it. <coughs> no one stops to think or comment on the evil that was brought about by the person. They, they promoted unbiblical things. And uh, people honor the wicked and not the truly godly. Solomon saw that the wicked die and their evil is soon forgotten instead of being memorialized in infamy. Yeah, he did some bad things, but they weren't that bad. I mean, look at all the good he did. I mean, have you ever heard anybody say this? I have. Hitler, mm, but he built the Autobahn and the freeways in Germany. He pulled the thing out of a complete financial devastation. I mean, he brought the economy back. He did some really good things. Uh, no. He was an evil murderer. Would God love him if he repented? Yeah, but he didn't. So, Solomon saw that the wicked died and their evil is soon forgotten. With his under the sun premise, Solomon is, is in despair that the wicked are not punished after their death. They just do bad, they die, everybody thinks they're great, and that's it. See, Solomon is still looking under the sun. He's not looking at eternity. We know something happens to people after eternity. We know there's life after death. He says this because in verse 11, the sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily. Therefore, the hearts of the sons of men are fully set in them to do evil. Men think they can do evil and get away with it. Because it's not judged quickly, men are prone to evil. Speaks of a hardened response made to the mercy and forbearance of God towards them. Man's godless ingratitude is as deep as the mystery of God's love and patience. Why would God continue to be patient with these people? Why would God continue to be patient with me? But he is. One of the common mistakes that people make uh, is that of interpreting the nature of God. One aspect of God's nature is his tremendous patience with rebellious men. Many of us know that personally, but we can always look and find somebody more rebellious than ourselves, can't we? <coughs> I'm bad, but boy, he is really bad. <laughs> God is exceedingly long-suffering. God puts up with so much, and he doesn't strike immediately. He'll often forestall judgment for months, maybe even years, waiting for someone to come to repentance, waiting for someone to repent and come to salvation. And so it appears that the evil guy is getting away with his evil actions and evil deeds. And people begin to misinterpret this this long suffering because he doesn't ex execute his sentence speedily. He doesn't immediately come down with a fist of judgment and man many times thinks he's getting away with his evil or that God is apathetic to sin. He wound up the world and just left. We can do whatever we want, right? He thinks he put one over on God. He thinks he's been clever and hidden his sin from God or worse yet, he thinks God is condoning what he's doing, condoning his sin. And because I'm still blessed and prosperous, God must look past what I've done. I know what I've done, but I'm, I'm I just bought the new Rolls Royce. What the heck? God's good. It doesn't matter to God if I lie or steal because, look, I'm blessed. It doesn't matter if I live an immoral life because look at all that I have. So people begin to misinterpret God's grace and God's long suffering and uh, they believe that God is affirming their actions in their life. This is not the case. And that's a fatal mistake to make because God does know, God does see, God does care, and God will judge. 
But because he doesn't do that immediately, because sentence of God is not executed speedily, God is giving the opportunity to turn around. God is giving the opportunity to repent. God is giving the opportunity to come out of sin and be saved. God's very patient. We read in the scripture uh, in Peter, God is not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. And that makes me think the real delay in the return of Jesus is not God's unwillingness to come. It's his unwillingness that men should perish. I'm going to give him a little more time. I, he's got the time set. I mean, it's, I don't know what, what he's thinking or how much time, because I, I, I think there's a different realm than the time we experience or know when we're in heaven. But as Peter's talking about the second coming of the Lord, he says in the last days there's going to be scoffers saying, where's the promise of his coming? Uh, they've been talking about that for years. He isn't coming. He's not going to come. Things just continue as they always have been. Nothing's changed. Peter said, the Lord's not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but long-suffering, willing that all should come to repentance. So therefore, we should think of this time as God's patience that men might be saved. God has waited so long because God has not speedily executed his sentence against evil people. They assume that God has withdrawn himself, that Jesus isn't coming. And all this talk about the rapture of the church and the coming of Christ uh, is just pipe dreams, a misinterpretation of scriptures. I've talked to people in churches who believe that kind of thing. That's not going to happen. And they scoff just as Peter said they would. It's because they're misinterpreting the patience of God, waiting for men to be saved. God is not willing that any should perish. God is very kind, very loving, very long-suffering. He's patient. He's giving chance after chance after chance. And it's tragic that people misinterpret those chances. And so they give their hearts to evil because they think God is too remote to care. Doesn't matter how I live. God doesn't know. God doesn't care. And they give their hearts and lives over to evil. Tragic, fatal mistake of misinterpreting God's grace. Solomon is saying, as a king, and from a perspective of wisdom, politically and governmentally, execution of judgment needs to happen speedily or it's not going to be effective. If a person goes through years and years of court and trials and retrials, if you watch how the attorneys put these things off for months and years, I think partially that's how they make their money. We'll just continue this thing forever because I can keep billing as long as it goes on. And, and the determination for the crime isn't brought about speedily. It loses its power of deterrent. If there's no punishment for the crime, <coughs> what's the big deal? If I commit the crime, nothing's going to happen to me anyway. I, I see that more and more. You commit certain crimes, and it's like, fine, misdemeanor, see you later. You don't even pay a fine in most cases. There's some states where they're saying, we don't even need you to post bail. You know, you're in and out. It's catch and release. <clears throat> so the statistics are wrong, too, about who did time for what was the crime, you know? Now, in the Old Testament times, they had no jails. They had no prisons. Why? Weren't there wicked people then? You bet there was. They had a different legal system. If I killed your brother, no policeman was coming after me. It's your responsibility as a family member to be the redeemer of blood and you would come after me. I knew that somebody was coming after me immediately. What would I do? Drop everything and run to a city of refuge. There were six cities of refuge, um, three on one side of the Jordan River and three on the other side of the Jordan River. I think you need to hit that button again. And you could run there and you could be safe and state your case before the elders of that city. The elders would hear your case and if they decided uh, you were guilty, they would go ahead and um, execute you. If they decided it was accidental, then you could remain in that city. You couldn't leave until the high priest died. You may spend the rest of your life there because once you go outside that city, you know that the Redeemer of blood is there. 
and he has the right to take a life for a life. So I, I would be executed then. And, but as long as I'm in the city, the Avenger blood can't come and get me. You see, it didn't go through courts. It didn't go through appeals. I would know someone's coming after me, and that's a great deterrent. I want to be very careful how I deal with other people. There uh, was a lot less violence then. People will tell you, you read the Old Testament, so full of violence here and there and everywhere. You know what? Comparatively, not like today. <laughs> We're letting the violent go out and run the streets again. We need prayer. So, nothing like what we have today. The more we study the word, the more we realize the things that God said are right. I may not understand it right now. It may take a while, ultimately. But righteous and true are your judgments, O Lord. Now, here's something you can go home and discuss among yourselves. Should we go back to the old ways? Yes. yes. I said you can go home and discuss it. <laughs> I don't want to start that debate in here. It would take us the rest of uh, months. Months. Because Jesus was kind, wasn't he? There still were no policemen. No. Okay. Because the sentence against an evil work, verse 11, is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. They don't take it seriously. I see a lot of young guys. They don't take it seriously. I think I shared with you about a conversation I had with a young man over in Chino Prison, the youth, the youth authority over there. And uh, I said, what are you in for? He goes, murder. He said, really? How long are you in for? And he goes, five years. If you're a minor, five years maximum, three years in good behavior. For murdering somebody. I said, how, how does that work? And he goes, well, I'm not saying that I did this, but I can tell you what I've heard a lot of people say. He said, look, you know somebody, you hate them really bad, you want to off them, you pay me $50,000, put it in a bank account for me, I'll take care of it for you. And if they catch me, and if they can prove I did it, I get five years. And when I get out in five years, I've got a huge savings account just waiting for me. That sounds horrible, doesn't it? Yeah. That's what goes on in our society today. They don't take it seriously. Verse 12, though a sinner does evil a hundred times and his days are prolonged, yet I surely know that it will be well with those who fear God, who fear before him. So in the end, it'll be those who fear the Lord who do well. And we already learned that in Proverbs. Fear of the Lord is depart from evil, Proverbs 16, 6. And the fear of the Lord tends to life, Proverbs 19, 23. I know that in the long run that life is the best. It's going to be well with the man who's departed from evil. Verse 13, it will not be well with the wicked nor will he prolong his days, which is a shadow, because he does not fear God. So in the end, God's judgment will come, and you won't be able to escape it. There is a vanity, that, an emptiness, a frustration that occurs on the earth, that there are just men to whom it happens according to the work of the wicked, and again, there are wicked men to whom it happens according to the work of the righteous. I said, this is also vanity. I'm, I'm frustrated. Why is this happening? Things happen to both good and evil. Why do the, the bad have it good and why do the good have it bad? Boy, that's a big question that we've all asked. And it gets asked all the time. Same thing happens to both. The righteous man gets cancer. The unrighteous man gets cancer. The righteous man is prospered and the unrighteous man is prospered. And Solomon is saying, I'm struggling with all of this. It doesn't seem fair. He makes this observation what happens to one happens to the other, and he's wondering, why do the righteous suffer? Why does a drunk with a revoked license uh, get in his car and hits a family and kills them all, and he walks away unscathed? Mm -hmm. That's just not right. Why is he not punished? This was the great question of the book of Job, right? Almost unanswerable apart from a life that appreciates eternity and our accountability in the world beyond. So the key is there's vanity in things done on the earth, but all things are going to even out in eternity. 
He's not looking at eternity. He's not seeing the end result here. So, sure, things don't make sense in this life. But James tells us life is just a vapor. It's like a match. You light it up, the smoke disappears. It's gone quickly. It's short. And things will be made right. The Lord told us the rain falls on the just and the unjust. So Solomon's trying to figure this out from a human perspective. Some wise things in here, but they are lacking because he's still looking at it as he's wandering around under the sun. Somebody once said, experience is the best teacher, but it doesn't have to be your experience. <laughs> it's good to learn from others. Someone else said, experience is the best teacher if you can afford the tuition. It can be very costly. So best to learn from others. And we are learning from Solomon. We watch this story unfold and you start to realize because you've learned from Solomon, I'm not impressed with somebody's education. So he's got three doctorates. Okay, fine. I'm not impressed with philosophy or the world's wisdom. I'm not gonna get caught up in the world's entertainment system. I'm not gonna pursue money and success as the motivational part of my heart. My motivation is the Lord Jesus Christ. What does he want from my life? I'm not going to be seduced by fleshly pleasures coming at me from all directions or pursuing them, whatever the case may be. I'm not going to give my life to partying. And I think we can learn from him and see all the frustration that came to him. And yet we can go the step beyond, above the sun. So I commended enjoyment because a man has nothing better under the sun than to eat and drink and be merry. For this will remain with him in his labor all the days of his life, what God gives him under the sun. So uh, with this meaningless life and nothing going the way it's supposed to go or how you think it should go, the preacher says, here's my counsel, enjoy yourself. <laughs> it doesn't have to be in the hedonistic way I've already done. It can be with morality, but don't go overboard. Just be thankful for what you've got. Enjoy your dinner, enjoy your family. You're gonna die, so make the best of a bad situation while you can, because that's all you got. <laughs> uh, this is human philosophy, nothing better to do than just wait it out, and this is true under the sun. Under the sun, life is very shallow, and you live life on that shallow level, the best thing to do is eat, drink, and be merry. That's what the world around us is doing, isn't it? Looking for something fun, looking for something pleasurable, looking for something good to do. Solomon is saying that's all there is, so enjoy it. They're missing what's above the sun. There's another dimension. Somebody compared it to a fish and a bird, right? The fish can't see what's up above outside the water. The bird, he's got a whole different view of things. He can even see the fish swimming down there in the water. The backslider and the unbeliever does not see another dimension. We know that tomorrow, we know that in the future, we as believers don't really die. There is no, um, what's the word I'm looking for? No annihilation, okay? There's transformation. We will all live forever in our chosen destinations. I love the way Pastor Ed says it. It's your choice, smoking or not. It's up to you. So when I applied my heart to know wisdom and see the business that is done on earth, even though one sees no sleep day or night, I, I'm trying to figure these, I can't get any rest. This is hyperbole a little. I, I don't even sleep at night anymore because I'm trying to figure all this stuff out. I can't figure it out. So I don't get any rest. And then I saw all the work of God that a man can't find out the work that is done under the sun. I, I can't figure it all out. For though a man labors to discover it, yet he will not find it. Moreover, though a wise man attempts to know it, he will not be able to find it. What can he find? Understanding. Solomon meant that even the wisest and most energetic person could not fully understand God's ways. No matter how smart you are, you can never figure out why Good things happen to bad people and bad things happen to good people. You'll never have an answer for why things take place the way they do. It's a pursuit that you never get to the end to. 
till we get to eternity and finish life under the sun and are above the sun. Solomon actually here begins to undermine his uh, once so certain premise of life lived without an eternal perspective. He realized there's got to be something more. He recognizes that man cannot find out the work of God in fullness. In other words, he's saying, I don't see everything. It made me think of an iceberg. You see this little piece of ice floating around. Maybe you've seen some of those pictures underneath the water. The thing is 20 times bigger. And God's millions of times bigger. You see a little bit. We know a little bit that he's revealed himself through the word and through his son. But we do not fully comprehend what does the Bible promise you and me? Peace. Peace that passes understanding. I can have peace about things as I trust the Lord. Not because I understand them. I don't understand them, but I do have peace in my heart that passes understanding. The Lord has given me peace that the things are working together for good. That's why we have the New Testament. So we can look at this Old Testament stuff and jump over to the New and go, all things are working together for good. <laughs> Boy, it sure doesn't look like it. It sure can be frustrating. But we know. We know better. He's on the throne. It'll all be settled when he comes back. I'm looking forward to that, aren't you? Yes. That is why we can smile and be joyful. Like I said, we read the end of the book. Turns out good. We win. Solomon's frustrated, and we know that all he needs is peace from God. Would you stand with me and let's close with a word of prayer?